of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Lansing branch was established in the year 1973. The dean of the Lansing branch is Dr. Jo uh, Dr. Terry Welsh, and the president is Dr. Tina Pettigrew. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word, or Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by, by Lord. The title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifest in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God are not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many, that there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. In a minor investigation on your part, in a good dictionary or encyclopedia, would prove to you that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any letters or characters in their alphabet that will produce a sound that is made by this letter J. And neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and correct name of, his, of the Father and Son. And Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Now Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. Now we have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Now Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has any particular or descriptive shape and form. Now we've drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. And Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim, the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man but without flesh and blood. Now this form could only be seen by divine visions and only understood by divine revelations. Now later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself into a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? And a further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface, the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him this tabernacle pattern in a vision. Now, Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court that goes round about. Now, these three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely 
nothing can escape the pattern. Now, our primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First, is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and as he actually exists. Second, is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood and humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, is to investigate the unexplained spirit law and the so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, is to encourage and to promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, is to discern, avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons. We contend for the common salvation in faith that was once delivered to the sons or children of Yahweh. N uh, ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained that there is no other name given among men whereby men can and must be saved, saving only in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal, eternal glorification of the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is to speak the truth. This morning's scripture lesson would be Matthew the first chapter, which would be read by Dr. Janice Welsh, and we will have prayer by Dr. Terry Welsh. May we have our prayer. Let's bow to Yahweh and honor Him. Heavenly Father, Yahweh, thank you for the privilege of being assembled here as sons in Yahshua the Messiah, your only begotten Son, to learn, understand more and more perfectly how to have true, close relationship with you. <clears throat> And we pray that you will reveal to us more, cause the revelation that you've given to Dr. Kinley to become more realized within us. As your children in Yahshua, we come to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brethren, and Judah begat Perez, and Zahrah, and Tamar, and Zarar begat Ezon, and Ezon begat Ram, and Ram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of 
Rahab, and Boaz begot Obed and Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon begot Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begot Abiah, and Abiah begot Asa. And Asa begot Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Ahaziah. And Ahaziah begot Jotham, and Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. And Hezekiah begot Manasseh, and Manasseh begot Amon, and Amon begot Josiah, and Josiah begot Je Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim begot Jeconiah, is that Je Jeconiah, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jochaim, Jochaim, begot Salath, Salathel, and Salathel begot um, Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot Abed, and Abed begot El Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor, and Azor begot Sadoc, and Sadoc begot Achim, Achim, and Achim begot Elud, and Elud begot Eleazar, and Eleazar begot Mathen, and Mathen begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Miriam, of whom was born Yahshua the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are fourteen generations. And from David into the carrying away into Babylon are fourteen generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto the Messiah are fourteen generations. Now the birth of Yahshua was on this wise. When his mother Miriam was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Miriam thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done in fulfillment of that which was spoken of Yahweh by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, uh, behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of Yahweh had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not till she brought forth their firstborn son, and he called his name Yahshua. The Matthew, the first chapter. I would just like to remind everyone to please silent all cell phones and any electrical devices and announcements will be held at the end of class. Our first speaker I would like to call on is Dr. Mar Marta Sona? So Serna.
morning, class. It's good to be here. Um, I'm going to have a chance to say something about our Creator. Um, wow, that chapter, Matthew, that they was long and all will be gotten, will be gotten, will be gotten. It was really interesting. Um, I won't stay long. Um, I'll do some, uh, I feel like doing a little bit of reflection. And um, the reason being, and I'll um, talk a little bit about where we are in the world right now. And it's very chaotic. And every day is something else. It's amazing. And, but there is always hope and there is always a savior. And that's the part that always people forget. That we have a creator that loves us. And I know the world is celebrating Jesus this morning, the birth of Jesus. And that is not correct. But that said, now, um, if you remember um, here, when the children of Israel were, uh, were in Egypt, that's chaotic. And you can see that in this chart because it's, it's dark, okay? Also, before Yahweh took in shape and form, this is chaotic before it takes shape and form and salvation comes, okay? So, if we look at the world today, I like to reflect on where we are, you know, on what's going on. If we look at the world, it's chaotic. We are in Egypt, but there's our salvation. Now, if you look at um, some of the stuff um, about the vaccine, you know, really they predict by June, everyone, we should be okay, meaning that the population can go to um, some sort of normal. normal. Well, you know, really I, I was thinking about that a little bit and so well, that's a coincidence. Because once the children of Israel leave, left Egypt and they were here, can you get that chapter about um, the law and salvation? Um, I think it was June 6th, uh, and that's it. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Exodus 19 and 1. And in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came they into the wilderness of Sinai. So we know it's the third month. We're not going by the Gregorian calendar because we know, um, so I'm not saying it. It says there in the Bible, somewhere in Exodus, that Abib is the first month. Please, thank you. Um, Exodus 12 and 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be, the, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Yeah, um, so uh, did it say a babe? I don't remember hearing it. Oh, yeah. So I was looking at that. Uh, which month is the first month? Abe. Abe. Okay, sorry. Exodus 13 and 4. Okay. This day came ye out in the month Abe. Okay. So, and that's the first um, month, and the first. Um, the beginning of the year. So the third month would be June, right? April, May, June, if we count. So now can you go back and read that part? Because um, it's not January, the first month. It's really, it's April, you know. But, um, and, if, and I don't get into what the month, each month meant, but, you know, means uh, all the different gods pagan gods but anyway Exodus 19 and 1 mm -hmm. in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt the same day 
day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And there Israel camped before the mount. Okay. So the law was given, and that was in the third month, on the third day. Okay. And I'm not going to get into, you know, the cleansing and all that. I just wanted to, so we can look, reflect a little bit, because I always, because I, well, you know, if, if you work in a world, you can get all the worldly stuff. And you're bombarded with it nonstop. And so once in a while, you, you, you can say, you know, he was not born in December. Ah, but that doesn't matter. Well, what is it that you're celebrating if it's not the birth? Really, they're celebrating um, the shopping, the commercial stuff. You know, the buying and the giving and, you know, people get stressed over stuff. But anyway, so going back and we can look and see here that there is salvation, you know what I mean? Because if you also I want to look at uh, where he said with a mighty hand. Um, and it's somewhere in Exodus 2. And that I... Uh, Ex yeah. Ex Exodus 6 and 1. Mm -hmm. Then Yahweh said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. Mm -hmm. And with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. Um, and, uh, that's right. fine. That was not what I was looking for, but that's fine. But uh, Or with eagles wing, I leave you or something like that. Really what I'm looking for when he took the children out of Israel and crossed the Red Sea and salvation. I, I don't know if it's Exodus, the 23rd chapter, you know, where the angel, but, you know, where, uh, so. Um, I have Exodus 19 and 4. Okay. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on so eagles' he, wings. Thank you. Hold on right there. So he said, see what I did to the Egyptians. So you, if we reflect, you can see what he's done in the world right now. We can reflect on that and go back and look at what's going on. Because the pattern overturns, overturns, and overturns. It's always the manifestation is the different, you know, there's different manifestation, but a pattern doesn't lie. You know what I mean? It's steadfast, it's steady. Please continue. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings. Eagles' wings, yes. And brought you unto myself. Right. So if I were to reflect and I said, you know what, instead of getting all stressed and with everything in the world of stuff, I can say, you know what, I can go back and look and see what Yahweh did here and be happy and calm that salvation is on its way. There's a resurrection coming, okay? And the last thing I would like to do is for you to get um, Matthew, the 22 chapter, 35 and 40, Mark 12, 28 and 34, and Luke 10 and 27. I can repeat those. So before I take my seat, I feel that we should look at the world and have a little bit of compassion and love. I, you know, we are very blessed to know something about our Creator. And at times I feel like the, and the people here, the Israelites, you know, that they had the knowledge and everything, but, you know... Um, can I say um, um, the Gentiles were not part of it till Yeshua, you know, buried and resurrected? I feel that that comparison sometimes when we look at the world is celebrating Christmas, I sometimes look at it as got all the Gentiles out there. <laughs> you know, it's just my way of keeping my head and myself straight. You want a Matthew 22? Yes, and, and 35 through okay. 40. 
Amen. So um, this is when Yahshua was walking with the disciple. And they were talking, uh, they asked him, I believe you can pick it up somewhere, you read 35. Matthew, Matthew 22 and 35. Then one of them, which was a, then one of them, which was a lawyer, I'll go up, um, I'll go up to 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying. So a lawyer, you know, is people who have knowledge of the law, you know, probably some of them that officiated in the temple at that time. So um, continue on. 36. Rabbi, which is the great commandment in the law. So he and uh, the lawyer asked, which is and they're, they're doing this to trap him a little bit, too, you know. And um, um, so which is the greatest commandment, right? And what did he say? 37, Yahshua said unto him, Thou shalt love Yahweh thy Elohim with all thy heart. And so love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart. And with all thy soul. And with all your soul. And with all, I'm sorry, and with all thy soul and with all thy mind so with everything that you have in you you should love your Yahweh Elohim and Yeshua but how you know you cannot love someone if you don't know someone too and that is the part that the world is missing you know they it's a false love or false belief you know the love well you, you can say the church they go to church and Easter, and then they go to church on Christmas Eve. That's not happening today. But they only go and do that in those days. But so, and the other one is Mark, and I believe it's almost the same thing. 12, 28 through 34. You have more? Yeah, please continue. 30, 38. This is the first and great commandment of the, the whole law. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So we have to love thy neighbor as thyself. So what is that? Love thy neighbor as thyself. I should love you. You know, you have, love you every little him. But also if you love your neighbor, you have to give your life. Meaning you have to bring into some truth and reality about your creator too, you know. If you have this knowledge, you should share it. Continue on. Are you done there? Thank you. Uh, Mark 12 and 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, mm -hmm. Which is the first commandment of all? And Yahshua answered him, The first commandment of the first of all commandments is hear O Israel Yahweh our Elohim is Yahweh a unity so Yahweh Yahweh Elohim and Yahshua is a unity continue and thou shalt love Yahweh thy Elohim with all thy heart uh -huh. and with all thy soul and with all thy mind uh -huh. and with all thy strength okay. this is the first commandment and that's the first commandment. Now, and before you continue, we always said that Yahweh Elohim is a unity. This is one of the greatest. I love this chart because it, it, you can really see what's going on. It's called a coordinated. It's blue for yeah, and pure spirit. Elohim, you know, in, in corporeal form is in lavender and Yahshua. But if you look at the cloud, it's, it's one. It's not three separate grouping. This is a unity. This is what we're talking about. Continue on, please. 31. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Rabbi, thou hast said the truth. For there is one Elohim, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart and all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength. 
and to love one's neighbor as oneself mm -hmm. is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So, so the greatest commandment, if you listen, you know, is to love Yahweh your Elohim, love thy neighbor. And he preferred that than having physical and, and, and these ordinances, you know, physical sacrifices. You know, so that's my reflection. Um, I was thinking about stuff like that. You have one more? I have one more. Luke, yes, uh, 10 and 27. I think it's almost the same thing. Luke 10 and 27. Mm -hmm. And he answering said, Thou shalt love Yahweh thy Elohim with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Yeah. So all those three are the same, you know. And with that, I want to say hallelujah, and praise Yahshua. Second speaker for this morning will be a pleasure to call on Dr. the Dean, Dr. Terry Wells. Hopefully that'll work. <laughs> anyway, good morning. I uh, hope you enjoyed that, and I appreciate the remarks that Dr. Cerna had made. Um, you know, today is the day that everybody calls what? Friday. Friday. Yes, very good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> there he is. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, of course, you know, it's it's what people call Christmas. And, um, uh, you know, we've had a number of requests and a number of lectures pertaining to the birth of Yahshua, and Christmas is nominally about the birth of Yahshua. In other words, it's named, uh, the word Christmas is named for Christ, and Jesus Christ technically Jesus the Christ, but Jesus Christ is the name that has been applied to the Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Um, and that's incorrect, which we'll get into a little bit. But, so I wanted to kind of give a, just a very general, basic uh, introduction to what Christmas really is uh, about and what it's not about, and, the, and really about Yahshua, uh, as he really is and actually exists. And I think, for the sake of clarity, I'm going to write a few things on the board. Um, so, and, and let me mention a couple. Of, oh, and I've given you some notes. So why don't you read uh, that top part, and I'm going to get the board. Um, it Thank says, you. Christmas is... Yeah, go ahead. Um, Christmas is not...
pagan god, which we'll talk about a little bit. Anyway, go uh, continue reading. There are, I think, three main points, and I'm going to try to kind of make those clear, and then we'll get into some more details. Thank you. One, the son of Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit was Yahshua the Messiah, not Jesus Christ. He would never requested anybody to celebrate his birthday, which is what Christmas is nominally about, the birth, celebrating the birthday of the man they call Jesus Christ, which is an improper name for Yahshua, who was not born <clears throat> anywhere near this time of year, December 25th, but was born <clears throat> what we would call June the 6th. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then... As far as any birthday celebration, uh, Yahshua never requested anybody to celebrate his birthday, and there is no record in the Bible of any uh, person, I would say, that's righteous ever having a birthday celebration. Okay? All right, and we'll get into the details about that. But these are three points that are important pertaining to this idea of Christmas and the birth of Yahshua. All right, um, now go ahead into some of the details. Um, the, okay. the name of Jesus was impossible, unknown and unused for hundreds of years. versions of the Bible, and most of them, especially if there's any that have any kind of a footnote, will even have a footnote or a marginal reference by the name Jesus, and I suggest you go grab your Bibles sometime and look this up, like in Matthew, the first chapter, and I think 21st verse there, where it says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Even in most of your King James and study Bibles, there will be a marginal reference by the name Jesus, which will say that is Savior, or uh, Yahweh saves, or the Lord saves, something of that nature. And, uh, you know, the moderator at the beginning of class covered briefly the name of Yahshua instead of Jesus being the true name of the Savior. And so I'm not going to take a lot of time to go into it, but this is just a very, very well-established fact the name Jesus was not even a possible word. It was not even possibly used for hundreds of years after he was named. And uh, that's primarily because the J, the letter J as we use it in, in, in the sound, the phoneme, 
uh, did not even exist in any of those languages. Greek, Hebrew, Latin, which are, are languages that uh, are mentioned in the Bible, and that the Bible has been either written in or translated into early on, uh, that name Jesus didn't exist. In fact, even the first King James Bible, which was published in A.D. 1611, that first King James Version Bible, there was no J anywhere in the text of that Bible. And we've got a, a copy here. They're now becoming relatively common. You can go get it. Those are the first Bibles. There was no J. Jesus was not in that Bible. And that was 1611. The first record of the letter J being written in England was, I, I'm, I may not have the year exactly correct. It was shortly before A.D. 1650. In other words, about 30 or 40 years after that first King James Bible was written, there is the first known recorded uh, evidence of a letter J being developed and used. And the letter J was a variant of the letter I. It was intent, which I, is a vowel, but the J was developed to be used with a hard consonantal sound instead of a vowel sound. And um, the letter I, when it's used at the beginning of a word, uh, is really uh, used and pronounced very much like our letter Y, like our vowels are A-E-I-O-U and what? Sometimes Y does what? Takes the place of the I. So, for example, if I have... Hope I can spell correctly. Hallelujah. Ya, hallelujah, and hallelujah, okay, whether it's a J-A-H, Y-A-I-A-H, or Y-A-H, we pronounce it the same, because this was the original pronunciation, and if you're going to put that at the beginning of a word, you would usually use a consonant or a semi-consonant like ya, way, or ya, shua. In any case, there was no J. Jesus was not even a possible word, okay? Um, and Again, you can look this up, the history of the letter. Yes, sir? Right here? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Correct my spelling there. Thank you. Okay. All right. So anyway, that's just a point. There was no J, so there could be no Jesus. Just not even a possibility. Yahshua the Messiah, his apostles, all of them would not even have recognized the word Jesus as being in the language. Okay? All right. Uh, so that addresses this a little bit. There's maybe another comment there. Uh, Jesus Christ is related to pagan gods, Isus, Christnos, and Krishna, healing gods. Zeus and Krishna. So, in fact, there is some evidence that Jesus Christ is related to a compilation, a, a, a conglomeration of the names of pagan gods, which can be used as Ye, Zeus, and Christos, then back to another culture as Krishna. 
so that, in fact, the word Jesus and Christ may be a compilation of words that are intended to be more related to these pagan gods and definitely not the name that Yahweh in some Bibles uh, of the Old Testament, but basically the five books of Moses' writing, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it's called the Law. The testimony of the prophets is Joshua through Malachi, and that comprises about 39 books. And Joshua said that he was fulfilling of those things, and every jot and every tittle of the law would have to be fulfilled. And that was his job to do that. So, his name, first of all, the name Jesus, is nowhere in the Old Testament. Couldn't have been there, and Yahshua's name was a fulfillment of what was already there in the Old Testament. And there are two people in particular, one in the law, one in the testimony, which had the name Yahshua, and when Yahshua the Messiah came in to fulfill, his name is a fulfillment of those. Now, the way those names are written in the King James Bible is usually as the name Joshua. And you will find that in... One book there, one of these times, a man who is written about as Joshua in one book is written about as Jeshua in another book. Now, the reason for that has to do with the translations as those things came through because, let's face it, nobody wrote J anything. Okay? They didn't even write with a letter that sounded and is used like the J, which I'm trying to express wasn't even in effect until about 400 years ago now. Okay? And <clears throat> the names that they used there were written in Hebrew originally, but then translators got a hold of it. And you realize they didn't have a printing press back in Moses' time, right? They didn't just stamp out and print out the same thing. People had to manually copy them over. They had people they called scribes. They would write scripture. Scribes would write writings, that which is scripture. And when those things got written over, they got written over into new languages, and in some cases, just a new dialect of the same language. Now, I'm, I don't want to go into too much detail, but basically the Jeshua, the book that uses Jeshua, was rewritten in an Aramaic form of Hebrew. Okay? And sometime, if we want to get into a big scholarly discussion about names and the language and so forth, we can do that. And it becomes somewhat important in terms of the uh, discussion about what the name of the Savior really was. Because, anyway, but Joshua and Jeshua are also written about as being the same person. But there are two people named Joshua. First of all, the son of Nun. who was back there with Moses. He was Moses' minister. He was the man that, in truth, was the creator embodied. Yes, and to me, when I first heard that, I thought, that's blasphemy. 
But I found out it was really true. And Moses led Israel all the way up to the Jordan River, and then Joshua, Joshua led him into the Promised Land in fulfillment, uh, and we've talked about this at great length in other classes recently, in fulfillment, another Levite, Moses was a Levite, another man who was a Levite fulfilling Moses was called John the Baptist. And actually his name wasn't John with a J, and you can check that out, Yohanan, okay? And Yohanan led Israel in what I'll, for modern terms, call a revival, okay? And because uh, it said all Israel went out to John, okay? And uh, he really, and it said he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers. This was a revival in Israel, okay? Uh, because Israel had become so corrupt and John was being used to lead them out of a set of corrupt customs and traditions like Moses was used to lead Israel out of the corruption of bondage in the land of Egypt. And John was given a vision in the wilderness, and it said John was preaching in there in the wilderness, like Moses came out of the wilderness where he had the vision from Yahweh. And there was just all kinds of details uh, about this. And then in the prophecy, you'll find another man I'm going to mention who was called Elijah, and Elijah was shown in a vision by Joshua as compared to Moses. And Elijah was referred to by Joshua as being equivalent to John the Baptist. In other words, that John the Baptist was used to fulfill Elijah and uh, also to compare to Moses. Now, the reason I bring that up, so Moses led Israel to the Jordan River, and Joshua led him into the Promised Land. John the Baptist led Israel in the revival. He was baptizing them in the Jordan River. And then he turns over the leadership of Israel to Joshua, the Messiah. And Joshua, of course, brings us on in to the true promise of Yahweh, uh, which under the New Testament is eternal life, which this physical Promised Land... man Elijah, who was compared with Moses and John the Baptist, Elijah was leading Israel in a great revival against the corruption of the Israel, Israeli kings of that time, um, <coughs> and their corruption had to do with worshiping pagan gods, which included gods whose birthdays were celebrated on December 25th. And uh, Elijah was uh, going against that, and he uh, did things that were compared with what Yahweh did with Moses. Uh, I, I don't want to get off in great detail. And then Elijah went across the Jordan River and turned the leadership of Israel over to Elisha. And Elijah means or Eliyah, which would be proper, means my El is Yahweh, and Elisha means my El is salvation. And Elisha then fulfilled the uh, things that were still remaining in the mission of Elijah. And Yahshua fulfilled all those things that were started in a revival with John the Baptist, and etc., etc. So there's a very great comparison. So, Yahshua the Messiah was fulfilling. All right, so it's important to understand his name had to be in fulfillment, too. There's no Jesus anywhere in the Old Testament, okay? So, his name couldn't have been Jesus, okay? He had to fulfill. But there's two people called Joshua, properly called Yahshua, okay? And I don't have to rewrite it, but this is the name written in English. And then there was the son of Nun. And then there was also Joshua, the son of Yahaz, And I may not spell his name exactly right. Yahazadek. Okay. And 
Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, uh, was the second in command of the children of Israel when they were led out of another pagan captivity um, because they ended up becoming captive to Babylon, then Rome, I'm sorry, Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece and Rome. So during the time of the, of the uh, Medo-Persians, um, I don't want to get too much in the history, but during the time of the Medo-Persians, the Persian king, uh, who... All right. Anyway, there, there was... I'm going to go back and do this on, on the chart here. Didn't really intend to get into all the history. Okay. You'll see here on these 490-year cycles, Yahweh is making things overturn. He's operating in 490-year cycles. It's 490 years between this uh, time of Abraham here to when the tabernacle is built, the same year the law is given, 490 years more until the temple is built, okay? And then there's 490 more years until another temple is built, which is the Zerubbabel temple. Now, the Zerubbabel temple was built under the commission of Zerubbabel uh, by the Persian king's order. Okay? They were in captivity to Medo-Persia, and Zerubbabel was given authorization by the king, uh, and it's called, the, if you want to know the order, it's called the Decree of Cyrus. Cyrus was the king, and he was given authorization to go back from Babylon and Persia to Jerusalem and build a temple unto Yahweh there. And when you read in the Bible about him, you'll find out in the list of the people that come up with him, Zerubbabel is mentioned first, okay, as the prime leader. Who do you think is the next name? Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. Okay, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. And who did Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, become? What was his role? He became the high priest. And he is the one that in the Bible was given visions about him as the high priest taking on filthy garments, which was a prophecy showing that Yahshua, the true high priest and bishop of our souls, would take on the sin of the world onto that physical body. Uh, just as the sacrifices previously, the, the sins were symbolically placed on the sacrifices. And then it says that uh, you, they, in the vision to take away the filthy garments from Yahshua and give him garments of glory and beauty and a crown, making him the king. And so that was a symbol that Yahshua the Messiah would come in, take on the sin of the world, man by the same name as this, as this high priest, and that he would take on the sin of the world and then go and be cleansed, take away the sin, and be given glorification or be glorified by the Father and made king of kings. So that's a little bit of history ba background on this name. All right, uh, Go ahead and uh, read the scriptures involved. Numbers um, 13 and 16. Mm -hmm. And these are the names of the men which Moses sent to survey out the land. Mm -hmm. And Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Yah Yahshua. Yep, Yahoshua or Yahshua. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the, uh, what Moses called him. The other people called him Oshia. Moses, well, they called him Oshia until it became commonly known that Moses would call him Joshua or Yahshua. Um, and, and I guess I'll tell you the reason for that. He was down in Egypt for 30 years with the people before the name of Yahweh was ever given to anybody. Before the name of Yahweh was ever known to anybody. And the first man that Yahweh gave his name to was Moses here at the burning bush. 
And then he was sent back down here in the land of Egypt when Joshua, Yahshua, the man called Oshia by those people, was 30 years old. And so when they came up across the Red Sea, and it says they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, Joshua, Yahshua, was 30 years old. And in the fulfillment, when Yahshua, the Messiah, came and was baptized, how old was he? 30 years old, okay? So, um, and John the Baptist does the baptizing here. That's a fulfillment of Moses. Said they were baptized unto Moses back here. So this Yahshua the son of Nun is compared to Yahshua the Messiah here. But the name Yahweh was not even known at that time. At the time that Joshua first appeared in the land of Egypt, which was 30 years before Moses came down here with the name Yahweh. And so that's why it says that it talks about the people calling him Oshia, but his name always was Yahshua. And that was revealed or shown to Moses in the visions, uh, which again is another story which I'm not going to take another hour to explain. We go in the scriptures and show the details. All right, so that's that Yahshua. All right, go ahead and your other scriptures. Zechariah 3 and 1. Yes. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of Yahweh and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Okay, so there you have this Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, which was the high priest. Now, this is hundreds of years after Moses' time and a few hundred years before the time that Yahshua comes in and fulfills. And he showed him in this vision, okay, in Zechariah accounting this, showed Zechariah in this vision, Yahshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, standing there and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him or to, or to accuse him. Go ahead and read. Two, and Yahweh said unto Satan, Yahweh rebuke thee, mm -hmm. O Satan. Even Yahweh that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now he And stood before the angel, mm -hmm. and he answered and spake unto those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquities to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Okay, and, so, and that's what happened when Yahshua died. Okay, sin was put to death with his physical body being put to death. His body was put into the tomb. It was burned up. The sins of the world were symbolically expunged, burned up. And then when he raised from the dead, he raised as a quickening spirit, not with that same physical body. And it was, he was in another form. And, and he, he was a change of raiment, okay, or change of garment. Go ahead and read, please. And I said... And, and I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So let them set a crown, a fair mitre upon his head. Go ahead. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of Yahweh stood by. Okay. And the angel of Yahweh charged Joshua, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Okay. So in other words, that blessings come upon him, because he, if he would obey Yahweh, and that's what Yahshua did. Is there a little more? Uh, you mean finish it? Yep. Hey, hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows, and that sit before thee, for they are witnesses. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. I will bring forth my servant, the branch. 
That is something to remember. That's another thing we could spend at least 20, 30 minutes on. Uh, in the Bible, because that's, again, used as a prophecy. But, for example, it talks about there would come a, uh, a, 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 I'll call it a branch out of the stem of Jesse, uh, and between his roots. Now, Jesse was the father of King David. David became the king of Israel. Yahshua was called the son of David, the inheritor <coughs> of the throne, which is what makes him Messiah. Okay? And so he would be the branch. Now, when he was conceived, he was conceived in Nazareth. And that uh, word uh, pertaining to Netzer uh, has to do with the branch. And that Nazareth. which use the expression, the branch. Okay? All right, go ahead and read. Nine. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Mm -hmm. Behold, I will engrave its inscription thereon, saith Yahweh of hosts. Okay. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In one day. In That's the day when Joshua does it. Go ahead. In that day, saith Yahweh of hosts, shall ye carry, I mean, sorry, shall ye call every man his neighbor.
asking for him that was born king of the Jews or the king of Israel. Okay? That's what Messiah is and was all about. And we covered some of this the other day. It goes way back to the prophecies that were made by Jacob or Israel unto his 12 sons. And he talks about Judah being a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. And again, Judah was the tribe that the kings like David and Solomon came from that became the kingship tribe. And way back there in Jacob's time or Israel's time, he prophesied and he said that the scepter would not depart from Judah, which is the kingly staff or throne of a th or uh, rod of authority, nor would the lawgiver come from between his feet until Shiloh come. And the word Shiloh means he to whom it belongs. And the kingdom belongs to Yahshua the Messiah, which would come through the lineage of Judah, prophesied way back there, thousands of years beforehand, by Jacob or Israel. And then uh, uh, we find out in more detail that it would also come through David, uh, which was the son of Jesse, which was the branch, the man who, uh, the, who the, the branch came from him. And all these different things, and you come on down and you narrow it down and you find out there is a promised seed. I mean, the promised seed of the king of kings was even made back here when Yahweh drove Adam and Eve out of the garden and cast Satan out, had him go, and he told Satan back there, or the devil, the, the dragon or the serpent, he told him that the, there would be one that would be the seed of the woman. It would have to come through the woman and that that seed of the woman would crush that serpent and kill him or bruise his head while Satan would end up bruising the heel of this seed of the woman. Now, the heel of your body is the part of your body that is lowest of all. When you walk, your, your weight goes on to the heel, and your heel will make the deepest impression in the uh, sand or soil as you go through. And so the, the flesh is the lowest manifestation of Yahweh. Yahweh, it says, manifest in the flesh as Yahshua the Messiah. And that physical body then would be what Satan would bruise. Yes, he was bruised for our transgressions, okay? He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. I'm quoting from the book of Isaiah. But I'm connecting it with what Yahweh told Satan way back here. It's recorded in the book of Genesis. That the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head, crush him, while Satan would bruise his heel or the flesh. So, yes, Satan would cause his flesh to be bruised, or he would die in the flesh. But in so doing, Yahshua would actually overcome Satan, and all these things are prophesied. So the seed of the woman is the promised king of kings, the promised savior, the redeemer, the avenger of blood, the Messiah. All these things that we're talking about are words that are used to talk about Yahshua, who was prophesied about in various different forms all the way on through. And here we're talking about some of the details of, of this as it, comes, as it comes on. Anyway, go ahead and read. 14. And the crown shall be to... Oh, 13. Okay, that's...
representing Yahweh. He was Yahweh made flesh. And when he says, I come in my Father's name, he literally carried with him in his name the name of his Father, Yahweh. Now, part of the reason that the people of his day disliked Yahshua, and I'm talking about the, the, the people in power in Israel, the reason they disliked Yahshua, part of the reason was because of his name. His name was Yahshua. Now, this gets back to some of this other stuff. Remember, see, a lot of scholars will say his name was not Yahshua. Nobody of that time period would have named their child Yahshua. They would have named him Yeshua. And... That is because it became out of uh, it became out of popularity is a, not an adequate word. The custom of that time was to have the name of Yahweh completely unexpressed, even though for hundreds of years before that. Yahweh had told them, praise the name Yahweh. And the, the, the various prophets said, praise his holy name, praise his name, praise Yahweh, hallelujah, which is what that means, praise ye Yahweh. During the days of Yahshua, it became a custom, a tradition, a, a, a I'm looking for another word. It was, anyway, they wouldn't say the name Yahshua, or they wouldn't say the name Yahweh in any form. They would not do it, especially in public. Um, and it even got to the point to where their custom was that even the high priest would not pronounce the name Yahweh except for when he was in the most holy place on the Day of Atonement one time out of the entire year. That became their custom, which is totally contrary to what Yahweh had told them to do. And I, there's places in the Bible where you can find out that instead of doing what Yahweh said, Yahweh, when he gave them his name, he told them, don't make mention of the names of other gods. Let it not be heard out of your mouth, which is part of the reason We'll go into that in maybe more detail. He, he said, Do not make mention of the names of any other gods, neither let them be heard out of your mouth. Instead of doing that, you go these hundreds of years later, and it became customary for the people to not make mention of the name Yahweh. And there's even places like in Amos where it talks about that, that they're, they're not supposed to even make mention of the name Yahweh. So when it comes on down to Yahshua's time, yes, the average person would not name his child Yahshua. That's correct. They would not have done that. Instead, they would have named, the average person might have named him Yeshua, and there were several people with the name Yeshua during that time period. That name means he saves. It doesn't mean Yahweh saves. And they intentionally were trying to wipe out the use of the name Yahweh in public. And yet, the angel of Yahweh, by Yahweh's order, told Joseph and Mary what to name the child. And that, they could not have chosen this name. It was the name Yahweh chose for his son. And he called him Yahweh is salvation. Yahshua. And so... When Yahshua came and he was ministering, even the very mention of his name in public was a... Um, um, they, almost, they really almost considered it blasphemy. Yes. Uh, and it, it just infuriated those people of that time. And so they were against him even because of his name. So when he says, I come in my Father's name and you receive me not, he meant it. And then he said, let another come in his own name, or if another comes in his own name, him you'll receive. 
And that was true with a number of people that is mentioned in the Bible. And even today, the name Jesus is accepted. The name Yahshua is considered strange, not right, uh, and so forth. And yet his name was not Jesus. And was not even a possible name for him until about 400 years ago. Okay? So, anyway, when he says, I come in my Father's name, you receive me not, let another come in his own name, him you will receive. Okay, go ahead and read your other scriptures. Matthew 1 and 18. Mm Mm-hmm. His people from their sins. Okay. He called his name Yahshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's what Yahshua means. Yahweh saves, or Yahweh's salvation. Go ahead. In 22, now all this was done in fulfillment of that which was spoken of Yahweh by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of Yahweh had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Yahshua. And he called his name Yahshua. And we'll talk about this thing about Emmanuel another time. Emmanuel was not as a personal name. It was a kind of like a title or the way you would name somebody. This was a fulfillment again. Emmanuel means Elohim with us or Elohim dwelling with us. And Yahweh told Israel back here, told Moses to let Israel back here, said, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. So him in the tabernacle was Emmanuel, was Elohim with them. That's in the law. Then in Isaiah, you have the prophecy uh, about the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, okay, which is Elohim with us. And, and that was not the only thing Isaiah said similar to that. There was also in, in Isaiah, he also said that uh, thou shalt call his name um, uh, wonderful, Counselor, the mighty Elohim, the uh, uh, Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. Now, they didn't write those names in the name book, just like they didn't write the name Emmanuel in the name book. Okay? His name was Yahshua. Okay? But Yahshua was Emmanuel. He was Elohim with them. He was wonderful. He was the counselor, okay, which also means comforter. The Holy Spirit is counselor, comforter, okay. So he was the king of kings. He was the everlasting father. He was all those things, but his name was, always was, and always will be Yahshua and will not be changed, okay. All right, uh, what more do we have here? We're going to have to move. Acts 4 and 10. Yes. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Yahshua the Messiah of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, who Yahweh raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Mm -hmm. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is salvation in no one else. Go ahead. For there is none other name. Because there isn't any other name. Go ahead. Under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Okay, so there we are. All right. All right, go to the next point then. 
Yashua. We talked about oh. this point. His name was Yahshua, not Jesus, not Christ. And there's a lot of reasons for it and details which we talked about. The next point is he was born June the 6th, 4 BC, not December 25th. Go ahead and read. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to read the point? Yeah, go ahead. Underneath. Wherever you're at, His, go ahead. Convocation or feast uh, that today people call Pentecost a lot, but was the Feast of Weeks uh, and first fruits of the wheat harvest back here. Okay, and it was on Sivan six, which was their third month, April, May, June, Abib Zif Sivan. Okay, and Sivan or June, okay, was the month in which Yahweh spoke this law to Israel on the sixth day. And that is, we're going to read it, that is where Yahweh told them that if they would, they made a covenant with him, and he covenanted with them, and he told them that he would make them, if they would obey him, he would make them kings and priests. So this is where they became a kingdom. Prior to that, when they were in the land of Egypt, they had just come out 53 days before Yahweh spoke this law. They, prior to that, when they were in the land of Egypt, they were not a nation. They were not a nation. They were a confederacy of brothers. But they did not have a national uh, identity and government. And Yahweh became their king, and so they became a kingdom. Okay? Uh, so, anyway, go ahead and read your scriptures there. Genesis 1 and 26. And, 26, mm -hmm. and Elohim said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creepeth thing that creepeth upon the earth. So Yahweh Elohim is talking about making the man as king in the earth. He's making a king in his kingdom. What day is this? Go ahead and read. So El Elohim saw everything that he had made. And yeah, Elohim saw everything that he had made. Please read. And behold, it was very good. It was very good. Over all the kingdoms of the, the, the plant and animal life and so forth. So he made him to rule as king of the earth. This man is a symbol of Yahshua the Messiah, who's going to be the king of kings. He's going to be Messiah. Okay, and what day is this that he makes the man? And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. This was the sixth day. The sixth day of Moses' vision here in Mount Sinai, which was in the month of Sivan or June. So he's there in Sivan or June, and this is the sixth day of the vision. So you have, in principle, you have a June the sixth here, or Sivan six. Yahshua, the Messiah, is going to be born. He is called the last Adam. Okay? This is the first Adam, and it says that this Adam was a figure of him, Yahshua, that was to come. So when this man is born, he's born among the animals. When Yahshua, the Messiah, is born, instead of being born in the inn, because they were in travel, that said there was no room in the inn, so he was born out there and placed in a manger among the animals. 
That's in fulfillment of Adam being born among the animals. But Adam is going to be made king, and Yahweh placed him in the garden. Yahshua is going to be made king, and after Yahshua goes through his mission, death, burial, resurrection, causing the resurrection, he is placed in the, well, his physical body is placed in the garden for death, but his, his, when he raises from the dead, he is in the, the glorification, which is like the garden in the spirit. in the month of June. Okay, go ahead and read. of priests. They were not a kingdom before that. Right. They were a loose confederacy of brothers, and Yahweh is uniting them under one government, the government of the kingdom of Yahweh, mm. which is established here when he speaks this law down and makes that covenant with them. He's here stating the terms of the covenant. Three days after this, he actually speaks that law down and they are now united under Yahweh as king of kings, and they are in his kingdom. Go ahead. And an holy nation. Mm -hmm. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Okay, so this June 6th, Sivan 6th, that's when Israel is born as a kingdom. Okay, and again, Adam is born this sixth day, of the vision of Moses, who is up here in the month of June, or Sivan, and again this kingdom is born. So Yahshua is born king of the Jews. And he's not born December 25th, he's born June the 6th or Sivan the 6th, mm -hmm. to fulfill. Okay, go ahead and read. 19 and 10, And Yahweh said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, mm -hmm. and let them wash their clothes. Mm -hmm. And be ready against the third day. Mm -hmm. For the third day, Yahweh will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So if they were there the third month, the, third, the same day, which is the third month, third day. And then in three days from that, Yahweh would come down in all the sight of the people. That's not the third day anymore. It's the third day after the third day, which is the what? Sixth, Sixth day. day. So this is going to be Sivan the sixth. Okay? Go ahead. 19 and 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain. And, read. and the whole mount quaked greatly, mm -hmm. and the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder. Moses spake, and Elohim answered him. By
by a voice. Okay, so Yahweh speaking from Mount Sinai thundered and, and, and as the sound of a trumpet blast. Okay, mm -hmm. and he spoke the Ten Commandments that way. All right. All right, next scripture. We've got to move. Exodus 24 and 9. Mm -hmm. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. And mm -hmm. there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. He did not give them the understanding. Go ahead. Also they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. Right. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Come up to me in the, into the mount and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Mm -hmm. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua. There's that Joshua, Joshua. Go ahead. And Moses went up into the mount with Elohim. Mm-hmm. And he said to the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again. Me and you. Joshua, or Joshua. Go ahead. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. And if any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Right. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of Yahweh abode upon Mount Sinai. And the mount covered it six days. And the cloud covered it six days. Yes, sorry. Right. And the cloud covered it And the it cloud six covered days. it six days. And those six days are the six days that he was reading about back there in Genesis, the first chapter. And on the sixth day is when he made this man as king. Okay? Mm -hmm. Moses up there in that mount. Go ahead and read. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And just as a quick note, the apostle John in AD 96 heard that as that voice of that trumpet. And he turned and got the same vision that Moses had received here. Mm -hmm. Read on. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Okay. All right. Good enough. Go ahead and read your next point. we got to move. Leviticus um, 23 and 5 through 7. Yep. In the 14th day of the first month, toward evening, Yahweh's Passover lamb is to be offered. Okay, that's the 14th of Abib. Go ahead. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unto 15th Yahweh. day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's going to be a Sabbath day, a holy convocation. A great Sabbath. Go ahead. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. On the first day, in the first day, ye shall have an holy convocation. That's what we're talking about. Okay, now skip on to the next verse. 15 and 16. Mm -hmm. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. All right, so there's that Sabbath, that holy convocation on the 15th day. From the morrow after would be the 16th day. Mm -hmm. So count from the 16th of Abib how much? Go ahead and read. From the day that you were brought the sheaf of the wave offering. Right, that next day the priest is going to lift up the sheaf of the first fruits of the wave offering. That's going to be the, the, the so you got the 14th day, the 15th day, and the 16th day is going to be the, the first fruits, and the, the priest is going to lift up the first fruits. So it's three, right in a row, 14th, 15th, 16th. And from the 16th, when the priest lifts up the first fruits, and Yahshua fulfills all those. Passover lamb, the 14th dies. Yahshua the Messiah dies as the Passover lamb. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the bread is not risen. Yahshua's body is in the tomb that date. And so his body is not risen. But then on the 16th, he raises, just like the priest raises the, feast, uh, the, the first fruits. And then count unto you from that day of the resurrection, how much? Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Each Sabbath is a day, is seven, a week of seven days. Mm -hmm. So seven Times seven days is 49 days. Please read. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days. And to the next day, the morrow after those seven Sabbaths, you number 50 days. All right. So on the 50th day after Yahshua raised mm. is the Feast of Pentecost, a Feast of the First Fruits of the Wheat Harvest. That's the day the Holy Spirit is poured out. That is also the same date. On the calendar, as Yahweh spoke the law and made them uh, kingdom to him, that is the date 
that the Holy Spirit came into the flesh of the believers. This is the same date that he was born and the Holy Spirit came into the flesh of the Messiah. Please read. And ye shall offer a new meal offering unto Yahweh. That's right. And ye shall bring out of your of your habitations two leaven loaves. Yep. Two wave loaves. I'm sorry. That, no, that's fine. I, now I want to move on to the next point. I just wanted you to see that in the fulfillment there. I hope you're getting this. Yahshua is fulfilling. Okay. Oh, let me get the 21st. Go century. ahead. Go ahead. And ye shall proclaim on the self same day that it may be in holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no serv- t- servile, servile work, work therein, and mm-hmm. it shall be a statue forever in all your dwellings throughout your generation. That's correct. And Yahshua is fulfilling it. Yes, okay, great. Genesis 1.14. And Elohim said, Let the lights of the firmament of the heavens separate the day from the night, and they will be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Okay, we focused on the date, June the 6th or Savan the 6th. Now we're focusing on the year, okay? And the year of his birth is prophesied in Scripture or foreshadowed, foreshown, okay? So when you go back again to this vision that Moses had on Mount Sinai, on the fourth day of the vision, you have the sun, the moon, and the stars, or the lights here, okay? Now, the pagans worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars in place of worshipping the one that created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And I don't think I'm going to have enough time to explain details about their pagan worship. But their pagan worship is what prompted them to end up having a sun god's birth on December 25th in culture after culture, society after society, because December the 25th, First is the day that uh, you have the shortest day of the year. It appears as if the sun is dying, and then you have a waiting. And after three days, you get to December the 25th. You got December the 21st and 22nd. Then you go three days, and you get to December 25th. And on that date, three days later, you have a resurrection of the sun. The sun is apparently coming back. Now, in they're worshiping the sun in the sky, reborn on December 25th, instead of worshiping the son of Yahweh, born exactly opposite end of the calendar in June or Sivan, okay, here. So they're confusing the creature with the creator. But Yahweh put those stars there as timekeepers and as for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Okay, read on. Oh, man. 15, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to Mm -hmm. give light upon the earth. Mm -hmm. And it was so. And Elohim made to appear two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. That's the sun and the moon. Go ahead. And the stars. And Elohim set them in the firmament of the heavens to lighten the earth. Right. and And to rule by day and by night and to separate between light and darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. So he got kings again ruling. Go ahead. And he in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And that was on the fourth day, okay? And these lights, it says there, he puts them there for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. And they are going to be signs of when Yahshua will be born. Now, if the sun is there on the fourth day of creation, and a day with Yahweh is as a thousand years, and I'm not going to have you read that because of time. We have, to, if you've got them handy... If you've got them right now, go ahead and read them. So a day with Yahweh is as a thousand years. This is the fourth day when the sun, moon, and stars is put there in in the vision. So the son of Yahweh, which created this sun, is going to fulfill, and he's going to come in on the fourth day or the four thousandth year of time. In other words, counting from Adam, four thousand years. That is the year that Yahshua is actually born. Go ahead and read. I'll get it real quick. Psalms 90 and 4. Mm-hmm. For a thousand years in thy sight are, but as yesterday when it is past. Yesterday when it's past is one day. Right. So a thousand years in Yahweh's eyesight are as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. 
Okay. All right. Go ahead and read the next verse. Second Gen- uh, Peter three and eight. Second Peter three eight. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with Yahweh as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So again, one day is with Yahweh as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. So again, these four days till the sun is put here is fulfilled by the four thousand years till the son of Yahweh appears here. All right. Genesis 40 and 20. Uh, and it came to pass the third day, which Pharaoh's birthday, that he made... Okay, now we're getting into another point, okay? I, I'm going to mention something else. Everybody talk, talks about this Christmas star, okay? Especially this year they had it and so forth. And a lot of people thought, oh, that's wonderful because it's appearing right at his birthday. It's not his birthday, okay? It's the opposite end of the calendar. Now, this conjunction of planets has appeared before... But it goes back 400 and 800 years before you get a really good view of it. So this is a phenomenal occurrence. But most of the time it doesn't occur December 21st through December 25th. Jupiter and Saturn align and give this conjunction at different times of the year depending on what the situation is. Now, if uh, all right, the, the two planets, Jupiter represents Yahshua, Saturn represents Satan. In fact, there was pagan gods called Saturn. That's how these that's how these planets got their names. Jupiter was a pagan god. Saturn was a pagan god. Okay, and that's true of Pluto and Neptune and all these others. All this paganism is used to name everything. The days of the week are pagan names, are pagan gods' names. The months of the year, with several of them, are pagan gods' names. Okay. And but Jupiter happens to represent Yahshua, Saturn represents Satan, and if Satan or Saturn gets in the way of Jupiter and tries to blot out the, in other words, there one is overshadowing the other, that is called an occultation. That is the word for it, an occultation, and it means it darkens the uh, the, the view of Jupiter, but they they shine bright. Together, And what happens is that Saturn is taking the light of Jupiter. Satan trying to take the glory of Yahshua and blot out Yahshua. And so there's another principle. But anyway, so let's move on to this next point. We got a couple of minutes left. So the next point is that Yahshua never requested us to celebrate his birthday. Okay. So go ahead. And then the other statement there is? Um, all biblical birthday celebrations were pagan. All biblically recorded birthday celebrations were pagan. And brought death. And they brought death. And were probably related to astrology. And they were probably related with astrology, meaning the worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Because this is the idea of your celebrating your birthday. Oh, you're born under uh, uh, in January under that sign of Aquarius or you're born under the sign of Taurus the bull because you're in I don't know what month it is uh, this is even modern culture is it has all these things as a descendancy of the worship of these pagan idols that were supposed incarnations of the sun, the moon, and the stars that Yahweh told him not to worship. And he classified that kind of worship as equivalent to witchcraft. Okay? All right, go ahead and read where you're at. we got just a couple of minutes. Genesis 40 and, and 20. Mm-hmm. And it came to pass the third day, which, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all the servants. Now, let me give you a background real quick. Here in Egypt, Joseph was down there. He was sold out by his brethren. He was... Uh, put in prison. He went down threefold and he's down there in the prison. And Yahweh is with him and uh, uh, Joseph, Yahweh uses him to understand dreams and so forth and interpret them. And the Pharaoh's butler and baker had been in prison with Joseph and Joseph prophesied based on the dreams uh, because Yahweh showed it to him that the butler would be restored to his prior uh, uh, state on the third day, but on that third day, the baker would have his head cut off and uh, his body would be given to the, the fowl to pluck. Okay? So there was death 
connected with this. When was this? On the third day? It happened to be the birthday of Pharaoh. And someday when I have about a half an hour, I'll try and explain to you more about why those things probably happened exactly like they happened on those days. But I have no time now. Go ahead and read. And he lifted up his head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Mm -hmm. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph but forgot him. And even then, see, Joseph didn't get... uh, anyway, Anyway, go ahead and read. All right. So that was a birthday of a pagan king, that pharaoh, and somebody died. Go ahead and read. Job 1 and 1. Job 1 and 1. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. That's Oz. Oz. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oz is like Oz, but Oz is... (laughs) And and it's interesting. Now, I want to mention something here. Um, People do... As far as I'm aware, there is no record of any particular genealogy of... um, What's his name? Um, uh, Job. Job. Yeah. Okay. That connects him with Israel, and this land of Uz. Uh, and so there's some there's some unusual things here. But anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Go ahead and read. Whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared Elohim and eschewed evil. And there w- and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Mm-hmm. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 chiasses, and very great household. Mm-hmm. So that his na- that this man was the greatness of all men of the East. So he was a king. He was the greatest of all the men of the East. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and read. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day. And now his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day. Some Bibles actually just say his birthday. Right. Okay, this was their birthday celebrations. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right, go ahead and read. And sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Mm-hmm. And it was so, when the th- days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them. And rose up early. In so the now morning. they had their own birthday celebrations. Hey, but Job comes along afterwards. And remember, he's perfect and upright in Yahweh's eyes. He comes along and now he tries to sanctify them in the eyes of Yahweh. Clean it up. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and read. And rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed Elohim in their hearts. It may be that my sons have sinned. And cursed Elohim in their heart. They're celebrating their birthday. Okay, this is a this is a common thing among the pagans that worship the sun, the moon, and the stars, which Yahweh Elohim said, "Don't do." All right, go ahead and read. Thus did Job continually. Mm-hmm. Now there was a day when the sons of Elohim had. Okay, let me skip to. Yep, got to skip. Eighteen quick. and nineteen. Yep. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Okay, so now they're having this birthday celebration at the eldest brother's house. Mm -hmm. And this servant of Job comes rushing into him and says, They were eating and drinking on on his birthday in in his house. Please read. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men, and they were they are dead. So Job's children all died. Mm-hmm. At the birth. Celebrating the eldest son's birthday. Yeah. Okay? All right. Go to the next example. Matthew uh, 14 and 6. Mm-hmm. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Her- Herodia danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, and she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me her, John, the immerser head on a platter. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oak's sake, and them which has, them which with him at, um, at dinner, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the, 
damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Yahshua. And when that's good enough. Okay. So John was beheaded as a birthday present. And this was John the Baptist. Okay. Those are the only three places I know of in the entire Bible where birthdays are mentioned. Okay. Specifically. All pagan. All accompanied by death. Okay. Now. This idea of worshiping astrology and so forth, I just explained. December the 25th is the uh, venerated day of the rebirth of the sun. Tina, do you have that other uh, handy? Real, just tell us if you have, do you have a mic? All right, because Jacob the other day uh, used this information as part of his... Uh, presentation, but there is a little, uh, you all can't see it out here, but it shows that God in multiple cultures for thousands of years before Yahshua was ever born. And that date was simply used in uh, Christianity or Roman Catholicism long after Yahshua died, buried, and resurrected. To, it was simply used because the pagans that they wanted to put into the church were already using that day as their day of worship. So the uh, Roman Catholic uh, hierarchy decided to use that day as the day of the birth of Jesus and have the pagans come into the church and, of course, you know, bring their money and, and, and power and influence along with it. So, and that process is called syncretism syncretism and that's been done with so many different things anyway I hope that's of some value to you expressing about the birth of Yahshua as it really is and what it's not and uh, so I will not say Merry Christmas but I will say have a happy eternity and by the way the true birthday of the Messiah in in, in the beginning is the day of eternity, and that is the day when he comes into your heart or mind, you're supposed to be lifted into eternity and spend eternity with him, so that really becomes your birthday too, is you're born again in Yahshua. So praise him. Thank you.
food class for this afternoon. Before we dismiss, I have a few announcements. Regular classes are held Sunday, uh, 11 to 1, Wednesday and Friday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. However, next Friday, class will be held at 11 p.m. I mean, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. There are no other announcements. May we all rise to be dismissed. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, alone glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all times, now and forever, let us all say, Hallelujah.
my feet Only you, you, yes you are You make me complete The vision is real From the mountain proclaim Spirit, y'all came and revealed his true name. Now from Egypt come forth. It's a call to his son. Yeshua, live in a new.
He's a very pleasant help in trouble.
Thank you. 